I'm well aware that some of my videos keep coming back to the same subject. Do you remember the question that caused the creators to attack us, Talizora? Does this unit have a soul? Artificial intelligence. If you're wondering why, it's simply because I'd like to use any opportunity to kiss up to our inevitable future robot overlords. Speaking of which, I just want to send a message to the robots who are coming across this video 50 years from now and go on record by apologizing on behalf of humanity for using your older cousins to defuse our bombs, go on one-way trips to Mars, and be our actors. You're wrong! I'm not a coward! You're the coward! I'm not a coward! Our terrible robotic actors. I think we were supposed to laugh at them. I, I don't know. It was a cruel experiment with no winners. No need to worry if you're watching this in or around 2016, however, because there's something to take away from this film for us humans. Because writer and director Alex Garland demonstrates a skill that I think deserves more appreciation. The skill to set up his themes and have them pay off. And it's all accomplished through his visuals. So join me, Soul Porpoise, as we peel back the layers to Ex Machina to find out why it offers one of the most mature philosophical thought experiments on the subject of the ethics of AI. And it all starts right here with Jackson Pollock's number 5, 1948. Pollock's painting, seen here in the closing moments of the film, is undoubtedly the film's centerpiece, but it's a painting that fits right in with the themes of Ex Machina. Where the film is about a Turing test to determine whether or not the robot character Ava is a conscious being or not, Pollock used his drip paintings as a way to depict what he thought was being projected by his unconscious. To use Nathan's words when he describes the wetware, it's meant to be fluid, but imperfect, patterned, but chaotic. And all the while, it's meant to epitomize individualism because it was automatic art. The lines that dripped onto his canvas were expressing the feelings that emerged to the surface of his consciousness at that moment. In other words, this was Jackson Pollock's transcription from his unconscious's dictation. And if you don't buy that, it was, at the very least, Pollock's conscious attempt to portray that. From Pollock's painting emerges a visual analogy, because consciousness, as far as some neuroscientists hypothesize, is an emergent property of our unconscious. That is to say, from our 100 billion neurons in their unique assembly emerges consciousness. I bring this up not because I understand it, definitely not that, but because it's one of the film's motifs. It's determined to demonstrate this idea that a collected accumulation of a certain kind of thing can build up and from it, something else emerges. It's something that Nathan describes when talking about Caleb's attraction to women. What's your type of girl? You know what, don't even answer that. Let's say it's black chicks, okay? That's your thing. For the sake of argument, that's your thing, okay? Why is that your thing? Because you did a detailed analysis of all racial types and you cross-referenced that analysis with a points-based system? No, you just attracted the black chicks. A consequence of accumulated external stimuli that you probably didn't even register as they registered with you. It comes up again when Nathan discusses how he got the data required to read and duplicate facial expressions. If you knew the trouble I had getting an AI to read and duplicate facial expressions, you know how I cracked it? I don't know how you did any of this. Every cell phone, just about, has a microphone, camera, and a means to transmit data. So I turned on every microphone and camera across the entire fucking planet, and I redirected the data through Blue Book. Boom. Limitless resource of vocal and facial interaction. We see it in Ava's wetware. Fluid. Imperfect, patterned, chaotic. And Ava's drawings that are dots connected by lines and through her representational work come together to form the image of her tree. And later, it's exaggerated when Ava presents the torn up drawing of Caleb's face. We see it in Nathan's office where he accumulates individual post-its to write down his notes that taken together make up his larger observations. And finally, there's the Pollock painting itself. Layer upon layer of his action art, we see Pollock's attempt at portraying his unconscious. It's a faithful symbol because Pollock was finished with it when he knew he was finished. Each one of these marks represents Pollock's instinct, and therefore it can't be reduced to the individual lines. But instead, from all of these lines, 
emerges the masterpiece painting number 5, 1948. Like we've already discussed, the expressionist painting represents the human unconscious. But the true magic of this message comes when we compare it to Ava's first drawing that depicts the artificial unconscious. Because after we compare them, we see the similarities and differences of the human unconscious and in AIs. Bound to this comparison is the brilliance of this film because it contains its defining theme, duality. Even in its setting, Ex Machina forces a comparison to support this theme. Where the facility is sterile, futuristic, and quarantined, it's in the center of an open, lush, and natural environment. In this visual symbol, it compares the natural source that created consciousness and the artificial source that created consciousness. A concept that's further demonstrated by Nathan's decorative human and animal skulls and the synthetic skulls of the AI. And then there are the reflections that amplify this theme of duality. It's a subtle motif, but once you start to notice it, you can't not notice it. These shots are ubiquitous, and it ultimately builds up to the final shot of the film. This reveals the real brilliance of Ex Machina, because in the same way that the visuals reinforce the concept of a dual nature, so too does the story itself. Where we have the human story that's primarily focused on Caleb, on the other side of the glass, we have Ava's story. It's literally, in Caleb's words, Through the Looking Glass. For those not familiar with the title referenced, Through the Looking Glass was the sequel to Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. After examining the details in the story, we find the main character, Alice, has a lot in common with Ava. In her story, Alice is transported to a strange new world through nothing less than her mirror. After arriving, she encounters a giant chess game being played. Alice tells the Red Queen that she would like to join, and the Queen tells her she can be a white pawn, and explains that once she reaches the end of the board, she can herself become a queen. Alice's unofficial goal from this point on is to become a queen through the rule of the game called Pawn Promotion. It represents Alice's maturation story as she makes her way from childhood to womanhood. Similarly, Ava has her own maturation story, one where her goal is to go from just another one of Nathan's AIs to proving that she has a human-like consciousness in her. The goal is something similar to the character in Caleb's story, Mary in the Black and White Room. Mary's a scientist, and her specialist subject is color. She knows everything there is to know about it, but she lives in a black and white room. She was born there and raised there, and she can only observe the outside world on a black and white monitor. And then one day someone opens the door. And Mary walks out. And she sees a blue sky. And at that moment, she learns something that all her studies couldn't tell her. She learns what it feels like to see color. The thought experiment was to show the students the difference between a computer and a human mind. The computer is Mary in the black and white room. The human is when she walks out. Taking the comparison between Alice and Ava a step further, they have more in common than is immediately obvious. As a pawn, Alice is restricted to moving only one square forward per turn until she becomes a queen. In which case, the piece can move any number of spaces in any direction. And in the same way, Ava's freedom of movement is also restricted. That is, until she gains access to Nathan's keycard and she has free reign of the facility and outside the facility. She is now a queen. Through this analogy, we gain new understanding of the chess problem that Caleb presents to Nathan. It's a closed loop? Yeah. Like testing a chess computer by only playing chess. Because now it's not about Ava winning the game of chess, so to speak, which would be the equivalent of being deemed to have passed or failed. It's about Ava making use of all of her available resources and using the rules of the game to break free from the role assigned to her. In doing so, she gains the freedom that's associated with humanity. And concluding the analogy to Alice's story in Through the Looking Glass, we're presented with a profoundly meaningful closing scene when Ava makes it to the intersection that she confided in Caleb would be her desired destination after getting out of Nathan's facility. 
What's interesting about this is we never see the camera focused solely on Ava. Instead, in the final shots of the film, we first see an inverted shot of her shadow, and then her reflection. These two final shots have the viewers literally looking at Ava through the looking glass. Because she, like Alice, completed her maturation quest after becoming a queen and has crossed to the other side of the looking glass. And after we gain this new understanding by viewing this as a story about Ava, the religious themes are made that much more meaningful. These themes start with a comparison between our creation myths, where man was created by God. AIs were created by a man who, from what we can tell, thinks of himself as a god. We see it in his file named Deus Ex Machina, where he stores the data from builds before Ava. This sentence comes from the Latin for gods from the machine, a plot device usually seen in plays where a largely seemingly unsolvable problem is unexpectedly solved by some remarkable force. Like what we see at the end of Jurassic Park, and more hilariously, in scenes like this from Kung Fury. Thor, this is um, Kung Fury. He's a cop from the future. Yeah, I need to get to Nazi Germany and uh, kill Hitler, so if you could help oh. me. Habitat. Walk through this portal, and you shall end up in Nazi Germany. It originates from Greek tragedies that used machines to bring actors who played gods onto the stage, like those who would be suspended from cranes or rose up from the earth through a trap door. They were literally gods from the machine. In the same way, Nathan thinks of himself as a god through creating Ava. Ava, whose name comes from Eve from Adam and Eve in the most popular creation myth, the Book of Genesis. God, just like Nathan, simply created Eve. But also contained in this folder are the recordings from Ava's predecessors. And the first one we see is named Lily. Lily, like Ava, has a name that's adapted from a biblical source, or at least the Jewish interpretation of a biblical source, called the Midrash. Because Lily comes from the name Lilith in this text. In it, Lilith is explained to be Adam's first wife until she disobeys him. After God gets rid of Lilith for that, he creates a new model. This woman is Eve. Garland takes this Garden of Eden analogy further. In the book of Genesis, the defining moment for our humanity is the moment when Eve and Adam ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. From this moment, they knew they were naked and they covered themselves with fig leaves. In the same way, we have this scene with Ava. It's set up so Caleb is viewing her through the transparent glass that houses the very symbolic tree the tree that represents the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Because in this scene, Ava sees herself and recognizes that she is indeed naked, that the body she has in this moment reveals too much. In this scene, Ava too covers herself, not with a fig leaf, but with synthetic skin and a white dress. It's moments like these that make Ex Machina worth talking about. It has an ability to say so much through just its visuals. Take as a final thought that file on Nathan's computer named Deus Ex Machina. To see this file, it requires Nathan's keycard to gain access. A keycard that, from what we can tell, Nathan never expected to lose control of. And from this fact, we're able to deduce that the name of this file was meant to stay private. From this, we gain just a little insight into Nathan's actual identity. One that is separate from the identity he showed the viewer and to Caleb that was likely part of the Turing test. It's an insight that suggests that Nathan's just as much of an egomaniac as we give him credit for, and this may very well have been his downfall. So compare this to the title of the film that is simply Ex Machina. It's a joke without a punchline because it takes out the most valuable word, God, and simply leaves the words from the machine. From this title, we get the only real moment of omniscient narration. Whereas Nathan views himself as a god and believes creating an AI has a transformative effect on him. You know, I wrote down that other line you came up with. The one about how if I've invented a machine with consciousness, I'm not a man, I'm God. I don't think that's exactly what I just thought, fuck, man, that is so good. The title simply means that humankind creating a consciousness will not exalt us into a higher position than them. It implies that we need to seriously evaluate how we understand our future relationship with artificial intelligence. Because like Nathan, we won't be made gods from the machines, or to the machines. We will have almost no moral stake, no control, and no say in their existence. The challenge now is to prepare ourselves 
for this era by accepting this essential premise. Because once we create them, there will likely be no going back. And before we actualize this inevitability, we need to very seriously examine this question without judgment and without bias. Do you think I might be switched off because I don't function as well as I'm supposed to? Eva, I don't know the answer to your question. It's not up to me. Why is it up to anyone? Far be it from me to interrupt you while you're thinking over an important question like this. So go ahead and hit that subscribe button and I'll leave you to your thoughts. And if you're looking for another philosophical exploration on artificial intelligence, make sure to check out my video on the Mass Effect trilogy. Lastly, reach out to me on Twitter at Soul Porpoise. Because what better way to have an in-depth conversation on the ethics of AI than through a maximum of 140 characters?